Hey folks, good to see you all. Good to be together. We are live. <clears throat> and it's been a couple weeks that we've been off. Thank you. But it is good to be back. Now I just have to find. I normally bring my study home, my outline. I don't have it. And I'm hoping people are logging on because I didn't send out a reminder email, did I? And I should have. I wonder if Mary did. She did send out an email. Good job, Mary. <clears throat> so that's great. That is great. All right, let me pull up and we'll... Uh, Put in the scriptures. All right, there it is. I will be right back, folks. Give me one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, Kay. Good evening. So glad you you made it. Um, I never know who's going to make it and who's not, especially when you're off for a couple weeks. You never know. All right. I'm going to put some of the scriptures down. Okay. Be right back. Give me one second, folks. Hi, Alice. Great to have you on. Sorry, I was just out of the room. Didn't see you join. Great to have you. Hope everyone is doing well. It feels like we've been gone for so long. And two weeks is a long time, but I guess not so long, but pretty long.
two minutes, folks. One minute, folks. One minute. Let's put some people that we want to lift up in prayer for tonight. Um, I'll give some explanations once we are, we are done. Um, All right, six o'clock. Well, it just might be me and Kay and Alice, which is awesome. Say the best and the brightest to be together. That is great. Um, let's gather prayer requests if we can. I just wanted you all to be aware um, that Jane Ott actually had a stroke and is in the hospital. Um, right now, the right side of her body is not really working the way it should be. So if you can keep Jane in your prayers. Hi, Sally. Great to have you. If you can keep Jane in your prayers, that, that would be great. Um, also, just, of course, lift up, and we'll lift up on, in our prayers tonight, um, the shooting victims in Texas, um, also in Buffalo, and also in California, just so many to count, right? Um, so uh, if you could lift that up in prayer as well, that would be great. Any other prayer requests that, that you all might have that we should know about? Um, go ahead and mention them. Go ahead and type them in if you would. And then we can, uh, we can address them and go over them. If not, let's go ahead and get started, and let's uh, let's go to God in prayer. Let's uh, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do come to get together with you this evening, as we are just about to open up Scripture and uh, read your Holy Word, and be able to understand and see what you have written, so that we can then apply it to our own personal daily lives. And I, I give you thanks for that, just that opportunity that we have as as your disciples to to catch a glimpse of your desires for us each and every day. I pray for Jane, for her healing, for her complete healing at this time. Um, I pray for all the families and the victims uh, in Buffalo and in Texas and in California and in other places as well. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, heal this land. And we pray all this now in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Lois Ann, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Lois Ann, who is now at um, Lancaster Rehab, and Dottie, who continues to be at home. Uh, and we lift them up in prayer. Thank you, uh, Kay, for, for that. Okay, um, last time that I preached, I believe I preached on what was called the House of the Lord. And... Um, so we're going to go ahead and open our scripture to 1 Kings chapter 9. I, I really hope you all have your Bibles in front of you, are able to, to see the, the chat that I put in front of you. And that way you're able to follow along and you know find the place and read it and just kind of keep reading it on your own. Um, I heard someone once say they did some of their best theological thinking and bad sermons because, you know, you get distracted and you, your mind wanders off. Now, of course, none of you wouldn't know anything about that, but just in theory. Um, and, and so I hope that happens as we um, 
as we read scripture together, that you are able to maybe find something or see something that's in that scripture and then just kind of focus on it and identify it and, and be able to kind of get lost in it as, as well. So this is 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. Verse 1, when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built and put my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. As for you, if you walk before me, as David your father walked, and with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my ordinances, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised your father David, saying, there shall not fail you a successor <coughs> on the throne of Israel. So we are talking about the house of the Lord. And, and today, for the vast majority of our time together, we're going to be talking about the literal house of the Lord. Um, what we would call the church. And, and I, I try to underline and emphasize the importance of the church uh, as a structure and as a location it is something that often as Protestants, we kind of downplay. The Roman Catholic Church, uh, for example, would talk about the presence that is there, that little red light, right? And, and so there's a sense that God is present within that building as a result of that. Uh, certainly within Judaism, we had this kind of deep felt historic and cultural understanding that that God abided, dwelt, lived, hi Heather, uh, in the temple. Uh, so let's just look at this scripture, which is a, a crucial scripture to understand its context and its background, which is that Solomon has just finished building the temple. Okay, what's the big deal about that? Well, David kind of wanted to build it, but God said, no, you're, you're, you're too um, fractured. You're, you're too, I don't want to say corrupt, because he wasn't totally corrupt, somewhat corrupt. You're too compromised. Let's say that. David, you're too compromised, and so we're not going to have you build the temple. Instead, we're going to have your son build the temple, and, and that's what happens in chapter 9. When Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord, um, the Lord appears to him a second time and says in verse 3, I have heard your prayer, and he says, I've consecrated this house that you have built and put my name there forever. So basically, God is saying there is something about this building, this structure, this temple that you have built that's important. There is meaning to the structure itself. There is meaning to the location itself. It, it's not like any other building. It, it, it's it's kind of like the, mm, I'm not going to get myself in trouble here, but in some ways, it's kind of like the Bible, where the Bible isn't just like any other book. There's inspiration that is attributed to it, that, that allows us to read it and understand that God has had a hand in writing the scripture. So we know that. I think we can say in a similar way that within a church building, the presence of the Lord is not to be discarded. Okay, and, and we're not going to go so far as that there's a physical presence of the Lord in that building. We would never say that. But can't we say that within a church, <clears throat> we can consider that a sacred place? 
I would say so. I think we absolutely can consider a church a sacred space. We need to be a little careful about attributing too much to a location as the residence of God, because then that would somehow lend us to think about a place as having some kind of magical powers. This place, because God is present, has some kind of power in and of itself, even irrespective of whether the Lord is present or not. The place itself has some kind of power that exudes from it. That's not us. We don't believe that. We've never believed that. And in fact, we have so not believed that, that that we've swung to the other side of the pendulum where we almost refuse to think that the building means anything at all. We almost refuse to admit that the building may have any kind of um, uh, redeeming value just in and of itself. And I think that pendulum is too far on that side. I think we need to find ourselves closer to the middle where where it's not the residence of God and it's not just a building like any other building, but it is significant. It has importance. Um, It is definitely called the house of the Lord. We see that all throughout Scripture. It is identified and given the name of the house of the Lord. But we also read, just in that chapter before that, look in chapter 8, verse 49. Then here in heaven, your dwelling place, their prayer and their plea, maintain their cause. So so the idea was that people would go to the temple, would pray to God, and God in heaven, not in the temple, this is important, would hear their prayers. And, And I think I mentioned in my sermon I'm sure there are a number of times that I said from my from the pulpit there at the church that within the Old Testament there was the understanding that God resided, God inhabited, God lived in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. That's where God was present, that's where God lived. This scripture says otherwise. It's a different perspective of going to the temple because God is there present, as opposed to what this scripture says, which is going to the temple and knowing that when you are at the temple, God will hear your prayer. That's what 849 says. That's what 1 Kings 849 says. But still the temple was beyond a shadow of a doubt. The temple was still the center of all religious life. Okay, that's a a very important uh, concept to to maintain, that that the temple within Judaism was still at the center of all Jewish life. Well, why why was it at the center? Well, let's, let's think about that. It is at the temple where you are able to make sacrifices to be reinserted into the mainstream of society. You just had a baby? You're not able to interact with people until after you've been to the temple and made a sacrifice. You just had leprosy? Yeah, you're not able to make it into the temple and... um, I'm sorry, you're not able to interact with any people. You're unclean until after you show yourself to the priest who is at the temple, who then declares you clean and then is able to make a sacrifice. It gives you the ability to mingle with others, right? So at the core of all Jewish religious life, beyond a shadow of a doubt, there was the temple. Okay, that's that's really important to know and to understand. Um, and so when Jesus comes along, first century, similar Judaism to what we find in all of the Old Testament, nothing has changed so much. The temple is the temple. 
The temple is present, hasn't been torn down yet. That happens about 40 years after the death of Jesus. And so Jesus understands the importance of the temple. And, and he calls it, in fact, the Father's house. And so beyond a shadow of a doubt, in Jesus' day, the temple was at the center of all religious life for all Jews. Everyone had to make their way to the temple at one time or another. I was visiting someone today, and they were in, in tears because of how much they missed coming to church. And being a part, not just of the building, but being a part of that community. It, it reminded me so much of standing in front of the Wailing Wall. Uh, Kay and Alice, you, you've been there. You, you know what that's like. And hearing people on either side of you weeping. Because they are not able to enter into their church. In fact, there is no church. Um, so that's what it was like for Jesus in Jesus' day. When we pick up in Matthew 21, verses 10 through 13, there is this undeniable sense. It's a fact. It's truth. There's an undeniable truth that the temple was at the center of all religious life. And so that's where Jesus ends up. Uh, let's go to Matthew 21, verse 10. Matthew 21. Okay, come on, Matthew. Here we go. My goodness gracious, these pages are hard to turn. Okay, Matthew 21, starting at verse 10. But before you get to verse 10, look at those nine verses before that. And, uh, okay, making sure y'all are paying attention now. I know there's only a handful of you. But what happens immediately before Jesus enters the temple? What is the Bible story that takes place in chapter 21 uh, verses 1 through 9. What is the Bible story that takes place, uh, or let's say it this way, what Sunday do we celebrate what takes place um, in Matthew 21, 1 to 9? So I'll go ahead and wait for that answer as we find ourselves over in Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> Who's there? Who's available? Yeah, this makes it a little more challenging for you all because, yeah, uh, Pentecost is going to happen a little bit later on. So, so next, in two weeks, we do have Pentecost. But I'm looking at chapter 21 of Matthew, verses 1 through 9. And there is a Sunday that we celebrate um, because of what happens in this scripture, in verses 1 through 9. Yeah, Palm Sunday. Uh, and so that's what happens in verses 1 through 9. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. And it's really important to not just separate. And this is why I love this nine-month Bible reading. I know I'm like three days behind, maybe even four. I'm catching up. Don't worry. I'll get there. Um, where was I? Oh, that's why I love reading scripture in blocks because then it's not just these disparate random Bible stories that, that take place. But instead in 21, Jesus gets on a donkey, rides into Jerusalem. Everyone's waving palms. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hey, hey, Jesus, make your disciples stop yelling if you would, uh, uh, make them be quiet. Well, hey, you know, if I uh, uh, even if I make them be quiet, <clears throat> the rocks themselves would would, would sing. Um, yes, I saw Amish everywhere. You're right. Today is <clears throat> today is Ascension Day, um, which is why Pentecost is so soon after Ascension Day. Absolutely, yes. Um, 
and, and so rise in Jerusalem, that happens. Um, and then as soon as he gets into Jerusalem, verse 10, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil. We knew that already. People were yelling, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they were asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then, look at verse 12. Then, so immediately after Jesus, still on a donkey, he gets off the donkey. He entered the temple. Then Jesus entered the temple drove out all who, was, who were selling and buying in the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And you have made it, but you are making it a den of robbers. And I stopped. The scripture there. I don't continue on about the blind and the lame and how he cures them. Although I did mention that on Sunday because that's interesting and fascinating. So Jesus rides into Jerusalem triumphantly on two donkeys. As soon as he rides into Jerusalem, the first thing he does is go to the temple. And he drives out those who are buying, those who are selling, and says, my house shall be called the house of prayer, and you have made it a den of robbers. Let's see where it, in Scripture we read, my house shall be called a den, um, sorry, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Turn, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. Isaiah 56, verse 7. Um, and, and this is uh, Isaiah predicting how Israel, Jerusalem rather, will be, dis will, will be restored. Verse 6, And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane and hold them, Fast my covenant, verse 7. These I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. You know, I didn't even get into on Sunday two weeks ago, how he specifically points out foreigners and says they're going to come streaming into this house. And then at the end of that verse, he specifically says, which, again, you don't find in Matthew, he specifically says, and my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, right? Isn't that what that says? For my house should be called the house of prayer for all peoples. You see that? Isaiah 56, 7. And, and so that's significant too, right? But nevertheless, the fact was the temple was considered and was called by Isaiah a house of prayer. That's accepted. That's allowed to be done within the temple, within the house of, of God. But what is not accepted is what we see in Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 9 through 11. Chapter 7. Verse 9, will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, 
which is called by my name and say we are safe only to go on doing all these abominations. So so even Jeremiah is talking about the temple here. So wait, are you telling me that you're going to come in here? You who steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known. You're going to come and stand before me in this house. I, I can almost hear God speaking to them as a parent. You're going to come in this house, which is called by my name, the Lord's house, the house of the Lord. And you're going to say we're safe? You, you think I'm not going to care about that? Only to go on doing all these abominations? Has this house, which is called by my name, in case you've forgotten, I'll tell you again, uh, again, this house is called the house of the Lord. Are you going to come in this house, which is called by my name, and become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching, says the Lord. So that's where that term, a den of robbers, comes from. Is the prophet criticizing the prophet, kind of lambasting those who would come to the temple fully aware of their sin and fully aware that they were going to do nothing about their sin and continue on. Um, yeah, with, with everything that is taking place, especially with the shootings that have taken place. I mentioned a session last night. We're looking at the well-known scripture. We're going to do Pentecost this Sunday because I'm not preaching on Pentecost. I'll be there, but I'm not preaching. And um, I saw something the other day that said something along the, the lines of there is a clear hypocrisy for those who call out the evil and yet are not willing to make any changes to eradicate that evil. Right? That's a clear hypocrisy. And I said to I said to, to the session last night, I said that that is part of that is part of my hypocrisy as well, right? As if I've done anything at all significant to be able to make changes within society and culture. And, and what the prophet here is saying and what Jesus identifies when he calls the temple, when he says that the people are making the temple a den of robbers, is that the people were prioritizing and making the temple a place that had nothing to do with the Lord and had everything to do with their own exigencies, with their own needs, with their own. And I think that's an important aspect, an important point to, to be able to fall. The, the, problem, the problem wasn't what was happening within the temple. Like the problem wasn't that... Um, People were buying and selling animals to be sacrificed. Jesus had, had no problem with people buying and selling animals to be sacrificed. That had to happen. That was the only way sacrifices could be done. People were not, Jesus wasn't unhappy that money was being changed so that people could buy those animals. It wasn't the act. It was the location that made Jesus overturn the tables and made him so upset. It wasn't the fact that people were making sacrifices that upset Jesus. And that's really important to understand because in the 21st century, someone could look at the scripture and say, you know, we don't do that anymore. So Jesus was kind of giving a, a, a precursor, a harbinger of things to come by saying, no, this is not what you should be doing at all in your relationship to God, which simply is not the case. 
Jesus did not speak against the sacrificial um, component of Judaism ever. What he didn't like was that it was taking place within the temple. The problem isn't what was happening, but where it was happening. And, and, and what he recognized was that there was a very clear um, secularization that was happening that, that, that almost uh, necessitated the people who were participating in the buying and the selling to block out where they were so that they could do their job well. You know, if you're standing right next to the Holy of Holies and you're selling this pigeon for, you know, 50 cents, you don't want to bump into that Holy of Holies and poof, see ya. But it goes so much deeper than that in that Jesus was making sure that he was teaching his disciples that the house is a house of prayer. It's a place where the Lord is to be lifted high. And he proves that point. If you keep going to Matthew 10, uh, sorry, 21, verse 10 to 13, go to verse 14. And he proves that point by almost saying, listen, this is what should be happening in the house of the Lord. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. Buying and selling? Buying also, right? Right? I mentioned that leper and that woman who had just, this, the young mom who had just had a baby. Jesus drove them all out. You should be doing that here. The blind and the lame, he healed them. Because that is what they should be doing. Um, the act of buying and selling mm -hmm. created a secular place of commerce in the, in the church, and that was a problem. Okay, so that's why Jesus what, did what he did, and I think it also forces us to kind of um, re-identify the church, the actual building itself, the actual location, and the gathering of people within that church as, as having tremendous value. Uh, and that's where I went with that on Sunday. But there's another component to this, which I didn't really talk about much at all. And when we talk about the temple and the building of the temple in the New Testament, you know, the Apostle Paul, who uses that concept to identify something other than a physical building, an actual constructed building. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. And in verse 16, you will see what Paul identifies as the temple of God. So, again, another opportunity for you to answer, not a rhetorical question. Look at verse 16, and, and, and what does Paul identify as the temple of God? And Paul would have been writing, and this is really important, Paul would have been writing at a time when the temple had already been destroyed. So there's no longer a temple. And so he can't point to the temple as, as the place, right, where, where the religious center of Judaism found itself because it wasn't there anymore. So in Paul's day, so look at the switch culturally, from Jesus to Paul. And only 30 or 40 years are, 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 are between the two of them. In Jesus' day, the temple remained the center of religious uh, life. In Paul's day, it would, be, it would be as if, yes, thank you, Kay, exactly. Our bodies, we, and, and, and folks, let, let's be clear, Paul doesn't just say our physical bodies, but we are the temple of all of us. All of us as individuals, not just our physical bodies, but yes, 
our bodies, our physical bodies, yes, our minds, yes, our heart, yet everything about us. We are the temple of God. And Paul had to make that shift in that transition because simply the temple was no longer around. It had been destroyed. So he couldn't be pointing there to, you know, kind of the religious center. He's saying, folks, since there is no longer a temple, the presence of the Lord is in you. And it is from that that we get our our Christian understanding of, of individual faith. See, in Judaism, faith is linked together and tied into the whole concept of, of the people of God and the land of God. And, and all of that is, is intermeshed, where, where Paul establishes uh, an understanding of a relationship with God that doesn't have to do with, with your background, with your genealogy. It doesn't have to do with the location. Paul establishes a faith that revolves around a relationship. A relationship with God that is personal and that finds its root within each one of us. It is much more, Judaism is much more collective. Christianity is so much more individualized. And you see that by the gazillion different denominations. And it all kind of begins right here in chapter 3, verse 16, right? Um, Verse 16, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells within you? And that's a key understanding to recognize that that we see ourselves, we ought to see ourselves as the temple of God. We ought to see ourselves as vessels for the Lord. So all that we do, all that we say, all that we write, and all that we don't do, and all that we don't say is a reflection of God as being as inhabiting us. Um, and that's a crucial perspective to uh, to our faith, and that's a crucial understanding to to who we are, um, to who we are as well. Two weeks back, and you get a thirty six minute Bible study. Sorry, I'm gonna end a little early. I'm done. That's all I have, folks. Um, we are back on track now for a number of weeks. Even if I uh, am, uh, uh, even if I, oh, okay, good, 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 good. Um, yeah, that, that there is a uh, there is a common a reform rabbi said due to the temple every home becomes a temple every family every table an altar every meal an offering every Jew a priest see that that's. Priesthood of all believers. That that is language that we that that we um, very closely identify. Um, uh, and now that we do not have the atoning altar, a person's table atones. And that was one of the questions I think one of you asked some time back. Uh, Judaism makes things corporal, and Christians make things spiritual, incarnational. Uh, that is interesting. I, I would say um, that Christianity is also <laughs> certainly Catholicism. I'm not sure what what corporal and incarnational, uh, corporate maybe Judaism makes things corporate maybe um, and not corporal like bodily. Uh, because I'm not sure what the difference is between corporal and incarnational. It is a great perspective. I do like that, and and, and I I would I would say that there is nothing contradictory to what that rabbi said within Christianity. Nothing. Um, in fact, that's what we find Paul saying here in in Corinthians. Um, is is we are 
the the temple of God. Um, and, and that language, right? Every Jew, a priest, uh, that that you know, the priesthood of all believers. That that's a reformed thinking. Uh, that that is absolutely re re reformed thinking. Um, Israel was a spiritual home for Christians. Yeah, no, yeah. I think maybe for some Christians. Um, I think for not for me. Let me just say that. Uh, um, I think there is, especially now in the last five years, ten years maybe, but certainly the last five years, a a uh, a um, I don't want to say resurgence as if it existed before. Um, um, no, what, what I'm saying is, um, there is a very, I just call it a very conservative stream of Christian thought that would see Israel as their spiritual home, but that very conservative stream of thought, um, also would Christ can't come back again until the temple is rebuilt. Right. And I, again, I, Jesus can do anything he wants, um, which again, uh, to dive into politics, uh, require, not requires, uh, putting your embassy in Jerusalem reinforces that thought, right? Um, again, all of that is from a, a specific, it was a limited Christian perspective that I would hope and I pray is not the mainstream. I don't believe it is. And I think that limited uh, conservative thought is, is, I hope and I pray, begins to wane. Um, where the more mainstream thought is really parallel, almost identical, not almost, even potentially identical to what the rabbi said. Um, which is which is interesting. Which is interesting. All right, thanks, Heather. That, that, that was great. Hey, you took me up to six forty one. So great. Um, all right, folks. And, and remember, we did ask that question about well, without the temple, how do they do sacrifices? And and that's how the how that's how the rabbi um, that's how the rabbi responded um, because the Talmud says that we do not have the atoning altar. A person's table atones. Okay. Again, all around that table, folks, do you see the similarity between our communion table as an atoning instrument? Jesus is the atoning instrument, the table isn't, but symbolically, right? That that's that's really really pretty significant, really pretty important. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you again for uh leading us and guiding us and forgiving us insight into your scripture. We ask that we would never tire of reading your scripture. And we pray this now in your holy name. Amen. Thanks, y'all. Have a good one.